Hey everyone, my name is Christy. Welcome to my corner. Thanks so much for joining me today in my baking corner where we will be exploring this cookbook some more. This is the 1856 edition of the National Cookbook that I bought at a local discount store um, about six months ago. So if you want to learn more about this book and the author, um, I will put the link to my first episode of Historical Baking right here. And today we are going to take a look at German cake, which is recipe number 393 on page 203. Now this is not like German chocolate cake. This is essentially kind of like, it looks like a scone or, I mean, it's a tea cake, right? It's a tea cake with dried fruit in it. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's what we're going to work on today. And hopefully it'll, it'll work better than my jumbles did the first time. They turned out pretty good actually. So I'm going to put my recipe back here. I have done all the calculations and I do have some substitutions because I don't have all the ingredients and I don't want to go out and, and get them. I'll put a link to the book, an online version of this book down below and I'll post the recipe over here and also down below along with my modern conversion. Um, and I'm doing a half batch again because it actually makes a ton of these little German cakes so I don't need that many German cakes. So I have all my ingredients out here right now, and it calls for three quarters of a pound of butter, one pound and a half of sugar, four eggs, two teaspoonfuls of nutmeg, half a wine glass of rose water, and one pound of dried currants. And I'm going to, I've already done the calculations based on what we discovered about her measurements in my previous video, which I'll link to here when I made the jumbles. So it should work the first time. This should be a pretty quick bake. I hope, we'll see. I'm going to um, start mixing things. And the history of this historical baking is not just the recipe. I also wanna talk about what it was like to be a housewife in the 1850s and 1860s. And the way I'm doing this is I'm going to read through her, one of her other books, which is called The Young Wife's Cookbook. And the Young Wife's Cookbook is actually a really interesting, not just cookbook, but also like a conduct manual. And I, as a medieval historian, um, my research, I use medieval conduct manuals, which basically tell women in particular how they should act, how they should treat their husbands, and also like little tips around the house. And that's basically what this does. And it's very interesting. She also has these little anecdotes after every or every couple of recipes that are really quite funny and I kind of want to explore them too. They're all kind of moral tales um, and I think that that's very interesting. So as I'm mixing things, um, I'll do a voiceover of important parts of this. So German cakes and how to be a good housewife. Let's get started. What I have in here is the butter and the sugar. So it's 170 grams of butter and 340 grams of sugar. So stick and a half of butter and a cup and a half of sugar. So I'm supposed to mix that all around so let's do, oh, and it's softened butter. The butter has been softened at room temperature. So it should be fairly easy to mix. I briefly want to talk about what information Mrs. Peterson included in her Young Wife's cookbook because like modern food bloggers, this is not just recipes, but also lifestyle. In her preface, she mentioned that this book will help women who have never had to take care of a household. She says, quote, if a lady has never been accustomed while single to think of family management, let her not on that account fear that she cannot attain the art. In her recipe section, she has many similar recipes to the National Cookbook, but she makes a point to include recipes from, quote, secondary parts of animals, like the heart, liver, tripe, feet, and other cheap portions of meat. Sprinkled throughout the recipes are little anecdotes that provide moral guidance, and then it ends with a housewifery section, and it's these last that I will focus on today. So then it just says, whisk the eggs and add with the other ingredients, roll out the dough in sheets, cut them into cakes, and bake in a moderate oven. I've already whisked the eggs. It's 100 grams of eggs. She calls for four eggs. I used two small eggs. It calls for two pounds of flour, which we figured out was that a pound of flour was about four cups. For some reason, that conversion is very weird and we had to basically use her information in this um, table of weights and measures. I'm adding more flour than I think I need. 
I hope that's the right thing to do. I hope she's consistent in that. We also have a teaspoon of nutmeg. So I have a half a teaspoon of nutmeg, half of a wine glass of rose water. This I also went to the weights and measures. So it says here in this table of weights and measures that one wine glass will equals a half a half a gill and two gills equals a half a pint. So one gill equals a cup and a half of a gill equals a half of a cup. That's what I've discovered. So I have a half a cup of orange blossom water because I still never bought rose water. Maybe if I'm gonna keep doing this, I need to buy rose water. But for now, I'm gonna use orange blossom water. And then it also says one pound of dried currants. And I don't have dried currants either. So I'm using dried cranberries because that's what I have. So this is not in any way German cake. No, it is, it is. I'm doing basically all the same stuff just with some minor, I think, substitutions. I'm going to add this all together and mix it up and it should be a fairly dry dough, unlike the jumbles from two weeks ago. Let's get that started. I want to take a minute and look at the short stories that she included after every few recipes throughout the book. Some of them are serious truisms and others are amusing anecdotes that can tell us more about the time. An example of the first is found after a recipe for a Sally Lunn cake, and she wrote, As there are some faults that have been termed faults on the right side, so there are some errors that might be denominated errors on the safe side. Thus, we seldom regret having been too mild, too cautious, or too humble, but we often repent having been too violent, too precipitate, or too proud. On the more amusing side is a story that comes after a recipe for quick waffles. She wrote, Sydney Smith was once looking through the hothouse of a lady who was proud of her flowers and used, not very accurately, a profusion of botanical names. Madam, said he, have you the Septennis psoriasis? No, said she, I had it last year and I gave it to the Archbishop of Canterbury. It came out beautifully in the spring. Septennis psoriasis is the medical name for the seven-year itch, unquote. With this amusing anecdote, we get a little chuckle, but also see what can happen if we pretend we know more than we do. I think that's about as mixed as it's going to get with the spatula. So I'm going to go in with my hands and then roll out here. Yeah, and it says roll out the dough, so I'll also get out my rolling pin, which is right behind me. I'll probably revisit the anecdotes in future videos, but now I want to visit the house with section. This part really fascinates me because it gives us a glimpse into the life of an 1860s housewife and all of her many duties. This was, of course, before you could easily buy cleansers and such things from the store, and you had to make your own. There are lots of directions for getting grease out of various surfaces, like curtains, wallpaper, and carpets. Also, ink must have been a perennial issue because we learn how to get it out of mahogany, carpet, and clothes. We learn how to mend all sorts of things. Remember, this is before mass production, so goods were expensive. If something broke, you fixed it. Things like glass, china, and leather. And of course, you would have to make your own glue, so there are recipes for that as well. Recipes for hand lotion, lip salve, and soap are also included in this book. Anyway, I think you get the point. As I was reading all these recipes, I thought that it would be kind of fun to try some of them at some point. So I looked at the paste for chapped hands recipe, thinking, how bad could this be? And I am not so sure I want to try this. Mix a quarter pound of unsalted hog's lard, which has been washed in water and then in rose water, with the yolks of two new laid eggs and a large spoonful of honey. Add as much fine oatmeal or almond paste as will work into a paste. It probably worked really well, actually. The fat and rose water, along with the honey and oats, would have been soothing for chapped hands, but I am not so sure that I have the fortitude to wash a pig's lard in rose water. Later, she discusses how to prepare feathers for beds, which includes plucking, cleaning, drying, and stuffing. But really interestingly, I think, she mentioned beds for the poor, and she recommends beech leaves, quote, as they are very elastic and will not harbor vermin. They should be gathered on a dry day in the autumn and be perfectly dried. The chaff of newly thrashed oats also forms wholesome and comfortable beds. Both of these fillings were cheap and readily available, um, but feathers would have been really expensive. So with these two examples, we see the breadth of knowledge that a housewife would have to have um, in order to run her household, and I can understand why having a book like this would have been so valuable. I'll definitely be taking a closer look at this book in the next few weeks, and who knows, maybe I will try some of them out. The lip salve looks promising, but that's for another day. Back to German cakes. 
So I think that's pretty well rolled out. I'm going to cut it with a round cutter and um, put it in on a pan and bake it at 350. I have baking sheet. I have a round biscuit cutter. My cutter was no match for the cranberries. Um, it kind of got all bent out of shape, so I'm just going to use a glass. really chunky with the glass. Maybe I'll try a small glass. Okay, we'll try this fancy glass instead. Yeah, that's more reasonable. And I rolled them, I don't know, a centimeter and a half, so like half an inch, three quarters of an inch-ish. That's not one of my skills, judging size and stuff is not a skill of that I have. Let's say I can get about a dozen this size on the pan. And, it, and they never say like how thick to roll them or how many you get in a batch. Okay, those are cut out on their pan. My oven is preheated to 350. I'm going to put them in for, wow, some of them are really thick. I think I made them a little bit too thick. So I'm gonna put them in for 10 minutes, check on them. I expect to be more like 15 to 20 minutes. I will show you the progress as that happens. So here they are out of the oven and they were in the oven for about 15 minutes, which I think was a little bit too long. If you can look at the, I'll show you. The bottoms were a tad bit darker than I would like, but as they say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So when they cool off, we'll try them out and see how they turned out. The German cakes are done out of the oven and cooled. And I think they turned out pretty okay. I definitely made them too thick and too big. This one here is, I don't know, three inches, and that's an okay size. But I mean, look at this mamba jamba. That is a major, major tea cake. I also think that it had too much orange blossom water. I'm gonna pause myself for a moment and say that there was not too much orange blossom water, no matter what I'm saying right here. After they cooled, the floral nature was very nice, but more importantly, I shorted the recipe by a quarter cup of liquid. It makes sense why the dough was so dry. And after they fully cooled, they were very dense, and while they taste good overall, they basically have to be dunked in coffee or tea in order to be edible. So don't do what I did. Now, back to my discussion of floral flavors. They're a little more floral than I like. I do wonder if rose water is less potent than the orange blossom water that I have. So I may need to invest in some rose water. But they're great with a cup of tea and they are pretty dense. So you definitely don't want them thicker than about a half inch. There's no rising agent in them and they won't rise at all. They're just kind of a dense cookie. But, you know, for dipping in tea or coffee, it would be perfect. They sure do smell good though. So all in all, I think this was a success and I hoped you liked learning about how to be a good housewife in the 1850s and 60s. I think I'm gonna explore this more just because I do really love conduct manuals. And like I said earlier, I use conduct manuals, medieval conduct manuals in my research and there's just something fascinating about learning how just normal women were supposed to act. The Young Wife's Cookbook is just so interesting to me because it has so much information in it and it was geared towards middle class women as well as lower class women. And so, you know, she included recipes and discussions of things that a lower class, not as well off woman would have in her home. And I find that very interesting. We don't really get very easily anyway a look into the lives of just average women. And I think that this this is really helpful. So I would like to do some more baking next week. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure I'll be able to keep a look out for that. I'm going to try and find a recipe that is slightly different because the jumbles and these German cakes were basically very similar recipes. And so I want to, I don't know, branch out and see what else I can make. Now that I'm feeling comfortable with the measurement conversions, I feel like I can be more adventurous. We'll see what I come up with. We'll learn more about being a housewife in the 1850s. 
We'll learn more about the little anecdotes after each recipe. So I think that's all from me. Thanks so much for joining me in episode three of Historical Baking, where we explore the National Cookbook by Hannah Mary Bouvier-Peterson. And I will put a link to the playlist for this whole series, um, like right now, whenever it comes up. And I will put the original recipe as well as my modern conversion below. Remember, I did a half batch. And I, and I think that that's it. Please take care of yourselves, and I really hope you have a good one.